on with our look at monetary policy. We've talked about the Federal Reserve and the tools they have and how they use them. Um, let's turn now to considerations of what should they do. We know how they do it. What should they be doing? What monetary policy should they pursue? That is, in, in given circumstances, do they, they need to be increasing the money supply, driving down interest rates and stimulating demand? Or do they need to be reducing the money supply, driving up interest rates, and constraining demand? In order to approach that, uh, we'll, we'll start out with something called the equation of exchange. This is from classical economics. Really, in a sense, it comes from when we were first beginning to try to understand macroeconomics, okay? So we're, we're past Adam Smith, but not by a whole lot. We're still transitioning from a largely agrarian economy to one of larger and larger businesses. And we're trying to say, how does all this stuff interact with one another? And we begin to see that when you have a central bank for a country, which directly influences the size of the money supply, you need to be able to understand what those changes in the money supply are going to do. Now, our current Fed was established in 1913. And I think in, in most ways, that's about the time we were really beginning to appreciate the impact that the money supply could have on the economy, good and bad. Here's the way we first began to try to explain it. We said, here's a, something we call the equation of exchange. And because of the way I'm going to define these four variables, it is always going to be true that they're equal. So bear with me for a minute, okay? What do these variables mean? Well, M is the money supply. What is the supply of money in the United States? And we measure that. Remember that? M1, M2, etc. Okay. If we take the money supply times its velocity. Now, let's explain that for a minute. The velocity of money. Let's see here. I've got a $20 bill. I'm rich, by the way. A $20 bill. How many times this year... This calendar year, the next 12 months, how many times do you think that $20 bill will be spent? How many times will it change hands? If, for example, $20 changes hands, is spent by someone 10 times in a year, what does that show you? Well, that was $200 in spending that was created. You with me? Velocity is the number of times you're going to spend that money. And we can estimate the velocity of money in the economy. And suppose, just for grit, suppose that, let's do the math up here. Suppose our money supply in a, in a hypothetical country is $100. And suppose the velocity of money is, say, 6. If there's $100 and on average each dollar gets spent 6 times, what's the total spending going on in that economy? The answer is, well, multiply them. And so we would say $600 is the total spending in the economy. Again, because of the way we define the terms, total spending. Total spending, does that sound like anything we've used before? Yeah, it's what we call aggregate demand. Okay? Well, let's look at the other side of the equation. Okay? P, P stands for the price level, or the rate of inflation, if you like. Okay? <clears throat> let's make this a hypothetical economy uh, that produces only one good. It only produces umbrellas. Okay? So their real GDP, the good this economy produces, is umbrellas. That, by the way, is Q, real GDP. So P is the price level, and Q is real output or real GDP. So again, continuing this very, very hypothetical, simplistic, simplistic example. Suppose that the economy produces, um, I don't know, 150 umbrellas. That's their real output. If people spent $600 and they bought 150 umbrellas, what was the average price of, a, of, of an umbrella? $600 divided by 150, the average price of an umbrella was $4. That has to be true because that's the total spending. And this also, by the way, $600, is total spending. 
So, again, remember, we're just trying to understand what monetary policy and changes in the money supply do to our economy. And we, we theorize this relationship, which has to be true because of the way we've defined it. And now we say, well, what if the money supply here, what if the money supply were to go to $200? Well, if you continue to produce 150 umbrellas and the velocity stays at $6, what's got to happen? Now you've got 1,200, so you've got 150 umbrellas. What's an umbrella going to sell for? And the answer is, well, prices would have to go up to $8 a piece. That if you increase the money supply and velocity doesn't change, prices are going to go up. Again, assuming your output is the same. So we're starting to get a handle on, we think, what effect will increases in the money supply do to the economy? And of course it depends, it depends very much on what happens to velocity, what happens to the velocity of money, and is the economy growing and producing more output or not? And that brings us into, in a very rudimentary way, brings us into a view of the economy uh, that, that rose up strongly in the 70s and 80s called monetarism. The monetarist point of view, kind of a subset of the neoclassical school. The monetarist point of view said this. If the economy is constant, and our research, they go and do the research, and they say, we think the velocity of money is also pretty constant, then we know that this would be what would, would happen that increases in the money supply would tend to drive up inflation. That's a very, very simple explanation, okay? But Milton Friedman, kind of the spokesman, the father of monetarism, lays this out, and in fact, it, it takes on a, a lot more importance this way. So I'm going to rewrite this formula. I'm going to rewrite it in terms of rate of change. So the formula is going to look like this now. We're going to say the change and the growth rate of the money supply, delta, the bar means rate of change. A change, the growth rate of the money supply. Sort of the equivalent of if you increase or decrease the money supply. But then we're going to say, let's do it in percentage changes. It'll make sense in a minute, bear with me. We're going to find that when you do it on a percentage change basis, instead of multiplying the variables, they become additive. And so you get the percentage change and the, cha and the growth rate plus the percentage change in the price level must equal the percentage, I'm sorry, I put price level there, what did I really mean? Velocity. Must equal the percentage change in the price level plus the percentage change in real output. Hope I haven't confused you too much. Let's go back one more time. We're doing rate of change. So the percentage change in the money supply. We can leave that out. Percentage change in the money supply plus percentage change in velocity equals percentage change in price plus percentage change in real output. I like to present it this way because here's what happens. <clears throat> and again, we're really simplifying for right now, okay? We know that for the monetarists, velocity doesn't change or changes very, very slowly. And so we say this number is going to be zero. Velocity is pretty constant. And then we say, what about real output? This is a classical model now. What will be the level of real GDP? Side note, remember this? Aggregate supply curve, vertical and full employment. We've drawn that in the classroom a couple hundred times now, right? I don't care where the aggregate demand curve is, what's the level of output? Where's your equilibrium? You're at full employment. So the assumption is going to be you're at full employment. Okay with that so far? Now, if this is a static world and full employment doesn't change, then you'll have no change here. If the economy is not growing, you'll have no change in real output. You'll be at the full employment level. And then fill in the blanks. That if you increase the money supply by 2%, what will happen? Oh, well, you'll get 2% inflation. You with me so far? If you're already in full employment and that's where you stay, 
and if velocity is zero anyway, I mean velocity doesn't change, sorry, then any increase in the money supply is going to be directly reflected as an increase in prices and inflation. If you're with me now, okay, look, we're going to take one more step. We're going to look over here. And we're going to say, well, what really happens to full employment output in a normal, healthy, growing economy? When the economy is healthy and growing, we might expect that real output would increase, oh, maybe 3% per year, let's say. So if the economy is growing at 3% and... You increase the money supply by 5%, what's going to happen? Well, 3% of that increase in the money supply will be absorbed by purchases of real output. But there will be a little bit more money than there was growth in real output. Money grew faster than real output, so you're going to have some 2% inflation. You with me so far? All right, let's keep going. If the economy is growing at 3%, this is the key question, if the economy is growing at 3%, or at least you forecast it's going to grow, that's your best guess, and you want to bring inflation to zero, you don't want there to be any inflation in the economy, so you want this to be a zero, what does that mean you have to do with the money supply? It means you need to grow the money supply at 3%. Now, let, let me say that again, okay? If the economy grows at 3% and you increase the money supply at only 3%, then you won't have any inflationary pressures. You won't be creating inflation. That kind of is a roundabout way of expressing what we call the monetarist rule. The monetarist's rule. Think about this before I say it. These are classical, neoclassical economists. Are they worried about unemployment? No, because the economy always moves to full employment by itself. Remember that self-adjusting process? So they're not worried about unemployment. What they want to avoid then, since unemployment is not going to be a problem, quote, then they want to worry about inflation. We want to keep inflation low. And the way we keep inflation low is we follow this rule. Okay? Here's the rule. Let the money supply grow at the same rate as real output or real GDP. Not rocket science. It says make your forecast for next year and make your plans to grow the money supply at the same rate. Very clean, very smooth, very elegant in its way. Very much like our, our models of supply and demand. Remember those? An increase in demand raised the price, an increase in quantity. And we looked at that and said, well, that's pretty, pretty smooth, pretty simple. Once you understand it, it's really easy. Well, this is too. This is a fairly uh, easy to see, I think, and, and intuitively appealing explanation of what the money supply does to the economy. And how, through careful, careful following of this rule, careful exercise of monetary policy, you can, if not bring it to zero, you can at least keep inflation down to a pretty low level. And so now you would have an economy with full employment and very low inflation, and that would be the best of all possible worlds. A couple of other points. If this is truth, what is the role of the government in regulating the economy? What is the role of fiscal policy? Remember that? Keynes, spending, taxes. And the answer is, we don't need it. The economy goes to full employment on its own, and through just following a fairly simplistic rule, you can keep inflation low. And so this became, in a sense, a sort of a fixed rule. And it said, you don't need discretionary fiscal or monetary. What does discretionary mean? Discretionary means use your judgment. Do you think it needs to have more? Do you think it needs to have left less? Make a judgment. We're not doing that here. We're saying, look, once you've got your forecast in hand, follow the damn rule. 
Come on, it's not that hard, okay? Follow the rule. Stop trying to intervene in the economy, government. Stop trying to manipulate that demand curve. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be fine where it is. We're going to move to full employment. It, 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 we may have recessions, but they're going to be very temporary, okay? And so we don't need the government going out there and kind of tinkering with the economy because it's going to correct itself to full employment, and through a very simple fixed rule about monetary policy, there's no judgment required here. Once you have your forecast, it's just, okay, grow the money supply at 3%. And conceptually, that's pretty appealing, pretty logical. It certainly is fairly straightforward. All right? Now, that's one view on monetary policy. It's not the only one. But I want you to grasp this one. Okay, monetarism, Milton Friedman, the equation of exchange, and the equation of exchange in its more dynamic form, in its percentage growth presentation. That's what we're after. Okay? Thanks.